she is of age, and yet she had had four major coronaries. She had congenital heart disease. She had two cardiac arrests. For 22 years, she had been diabetic. She said, you name it, kid, and I've got it, or I've had it. And yet God spared her for 82 years to give her testimony, one of the most powerful testimonies in America. And she has led, God has used her to lead, multiply thousands of people to Jesus Christ. But in closing, let me ask you, have you ever made a total commitment? I don't mean if you come forward in a church service. I don't mean if you put your name on the church roll somewhere. Have you been baptized? Are you sure that you've been born again and you've given Jesus Christ every faculty of your being, every little compartment in the heart of your soul? Does it belong to Christ? Shall we bow in prayer? If not, before we go, we're going to have a closing prayer. And Christians all over this congregation have been praying for you all day long today and probably for many nights before this meeting came, became a reality. I'm not going to embarrass any one of you. I'm not going to point you out. But I'm going to ask you a personal question, pointed question, piercing question. Are you sure? Are you certain? If you have the smallest doubt in your mind about your salvation, whether or not you've ever really been born again, nobody on earth would love to see you make a commitment more than this pastor right here. I know his heart. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out, but I would like to remember you now in this closing prayer. And if you just slip your hand up for prayer and say, by the lifted hand, Brother Grady, pray for me. You raise your hand right now. Boy, girl, man or woman, old or young. You say, I think I'm a Christian. I hope so. I guess so. Maybe so. Perhaps so, but I'm not sure about it. Just slip your hand up right now for prayer and then take it down. We're going to close in a moment. Would you like to be included in this closing prayer? Well, God bless you. Maybe there are others here tonight who say by the same sign, by the lifted hand, Brother Grady, it's been a long time since I spent an hour in prayer. It's been a long, long time since I had the unspeakable joy of winning somebody else to Jesus Christ. It's been a long, long time since I sat down and read a long chapter of the Bible, longer than one of the short Psalms or something. And I just don't know the Word of God. I, I want to know it, but I just don't know it. And I feel I'm a backslider because I've neglected in my spiritual life, my quiet time, my devotional time, my prayer time, my Bible reading time, and my soul winning witnessing time. Pray for me. I want to be a completely dedicated Christian. Remember me in that closing prayer. You put your hand up right now. And God bless you. I see them so many of them. God bless you. Yes, God bless you. You know what Jesus said? He said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And when you lifted your hand, to me that was an indication you were hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And Jesus said, You shall be filled. Anyone else before we pray now and before we go? Brother Grady, include me in that prayer. I didn't slip my hand up, but I, I've been thinking about it, and I want to go all out for the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. Please include me in that closing prayer. I want the pastor and the people of this church to pray for me. Just raise your hand. Anyone else before we pray and before we go? Just raise your hand right now. I, I, may, I may not see it, but God will see it. Anyone, anywhere, by the lifted hand, pray for me. All right, shall we pray? Lord God, in that all-powerful, all-prevailing, all triumphant name of the Lord Jesus, we pray for these many tonight who raise their hands. Thou knowest the need of their hearts. Thou, know, thou knowest the longing of their souls. And in the next few moments, give them strength and faith and courage and conviction to step out and make public this private concern and this private decision in their hearts. We know that our Lord Jesus never gave an invitation, but, but, but making it public. He always made his invitation public. And he said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. But he also said, if you deny me before men, and we could deny him by failing to confess him publicly here tonight. He said, if you deny me, I'll have to deny you before my heavenly Father. And give these precious young people, these men and women, the strength and the courage this night to let go and let God have his way. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to close now with a, with a hymn. I'm going to ask the pastor to come down here and stand on the floor level in front of this pulpit. And I'm
going to ask every one of you who raised your hand for prayer to come down and meet us at this altar. Or down front, you can kneel, you can stand, or you can be seated. Let's make it comfortable on yourself. But we want you to come. While we stand and sing, just as I am, it's an old hymn we all know. And while we sing and while we pray and while we wait, don't you wait. You just quietly, reverently slip out and come. But come quickly. We're going to close the service now in a moment. Sing it. Just as come on. I am. section some car would plow into the side of your car and suddenly you'd be clipped into eternity are you sure you're certain you're ready to meet God do you know it if you have the slightest little question mark in your mind about it make sure tonight Jesus said confess me before men then I'll confess you before my heavenly father I'm asking you to do really one of the hardest things you have been called upon to do, but I'm asking what Je Jesus already asked you to do. And we're going to wait for a moment. Now, others lifted your hands for prayer saying, I want to be a more deeply dedicated and spirit-filled Christian. I want to be used of God. We're going to ask you to come. Just slip out and come, boy, girl, man, or woman, old or young. We're going to sing one more standard and nobody else comes and we're going to close. As far as I'm concerned, we're going to close the invitation. But if you'll come, maybe somebody else will if you step out, somebody else step out. All right, brother, let's sing softly another stanza and prayerfully. Just Come on. Don't win the back. God bless these young people who come, all who come. Anyone else want to come? Rededicate, recommit your life to Christ and his cause and his church. You make a start, we'll wait for you. That's right. Come on. God bless you. I know the hour is getting late and time is slipping by, but this is the most important part of the entire service, as the pastor said this morning. I'm going to ask the singer to just hum softly one more time the tune while he hums and while we pray and while we wait. If there's anyone else who wants to come, just slip out and come. We'll wait right now. Come on. God says, Behold, now is except the time. The day is the day of salvation. Anyone else want to come? Make a clean cut decision for Christ and God and eternity. Come on.
And we're so thankful because that God forsook his son that you will never forsake us. Lord Jesus, thank you for your nearness. Thank you for the services we've enjoyed today, for the ones that were saved and the ones added to us. Now tonight we pray, dear Lord, that every child of God in this service, they'd present themselves in that need and let you meet that need. And then for those that are unsaved tonight, I pray tonight they couldn't sleep until they turn to thee. Have your way, Lord Jesus, in every life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Let me uh, say a word or two. Didn't you enjoy Brother Grady? I'd like to take an offering. Let's take an offering for Grady Wilson. Wouldn't that be great? I'll tell you, I... Ushers, if you'll get the offering plates, we'll take an offering for Brother Grady Wilson. And I want you to give generously tonight. Just write out a real good check. God will bless you for it. And uh, ushers, if you'll come forward. tonight and give generously to the man of God. Now go ahead, ushers, and take the offering, if you will, please. Billy, just tell him to go ahead and make the check out to the church, and the ushers will count it. Brother Hanks, tell him to go ahead and make it out to the church, and the ushers will count it, and then uh, give Brother Grady, one check. You give generously tonight. While they're passing the offering plate, volunteers are needed for the children's community and also for Dallas Life Foundation. Lisa's heading up a list of volunteers. And you say, well, what can I do? All of us can do something. I was thrilled to about an hour ago when I started to leave the children's home tonight and Heather, one of the 11 year old Indian girls that we've had uh, came to me as I was leaving, came out to the car and she said, Preacher, when can I get saved? And I said, right now. And so I just went back in and got one of the ladies to lead her to Christ and what a blessing that was. Also down at Dallas Life Foundation, we were setting up some programs down there and we'll have classes for the illiterate. Uh, we'll have some uh, seminars on the home.
where there's almost as many in the first service as there's in the last service, just about splitting down the middle, and that's good. Uh, Haynes, I'm glad you're here, you and Connie. And then, Gary, that's your mom and dad from up in... Your mother-in-law and Carol's mother and dad. I'm delighted you're in the service. Just real glad you're here. You, Carol's a sweet lady. And Gary's a good man. And then in the back, Charlie and Jean and Judy Brown. Would you all stand, please, Charlie? Where are you? Charlie was the first music director this church ever had. Uh, he got saved the night I surrendered to preach, and he said, well, I'll just lead singing for you. And so he began leading singing, and what a blessing Charlie and Jean have been through the years. They've been pastoring a church down in Freeport, Texas for about, what, 10 years? 11 years now, and they surprised us, and they're in the service this morning. We're delighted they're here. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Romans, chapter number 14, please. Romans chapter number 14, and I'll read verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And I'll speak on the subject of the accountability of the steward. We're in the midst of our mission, missions emphasis month. And what a delight it is to be able to share the word of God to the uttermost part of the earth. So I'm glad you're here today. Romans chapter 14, verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. For why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us... <coughs> shall give an account of himself to God. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 27, the Bible said it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Paul writing to a church at Rome, supposedly divinely bought, spirit indwelt, born-again Christians, and he makes an amazing statement. He said, we must all give an account of ourselves unto God. Mr. Daniel Webster, during the administration of President Fillmore, Daniel Webster, then Secretary of State, was invited to dinner at the Astor House in New York City with some 20 other men. And as they sat there, around the dinner table, one man asked Mr. Webster, he said, what is the greatest thought that you ever had and the most important thought you ever had? And Daniel Webster replied, my individual responsibility to God. Amen. Here Paul said we must all, everyone must give an account of himself unto God. Mr. Webster says the word account means to consider. It means to judge. It means to furnish a reckoning. It means to explain a c condition of being accountable, liable, responsible. It, for the child of God, it's a lifetime commitment. Amen. Accountability has to do with doing and not being. I read the account of a young man back in World War II that came out of the new grounds of East Texas, where I came from, and at that time, well, all of the young men were getting those greetings in the mail. And he received a questionnaire from the United States Army. There were many questions there, and him being from East Texas, as I was, didn't understand them all. 
And so he tussled with the questions for a while, and then he just put a big X over all of it and wrote across the bottom, I'm ready when you're ready, and signed his name. That's the way it should be for every born-again child of God. I'm ready when you're ready. I believe that when we see God as he is, we see ourselves as we are, and if we're truly in a right relationship with God, it'll always be, I'm ready when you're ready. All said to the church at Rome, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. We that are saved are saved for a purpose. And that purpose is to bring glory to God. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Peter said, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Paul said, And every man shall give an account of himself unto God. Accountability has to do with stewardship. You cannot be a good Christian unless you are a good steward. I look at our accountability to God. He said, every man must give an account of himself unto God. I look at my accountability to God, and I realize that I'll be accountable to God for my words. I read in Matthew chapter number 20, 12 and verse number 36, where our Lord said, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And so we will be accountable unto God for our words. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11. The wise man said a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pitchers of silver. God said, out of the abundance of the heart, the man speaketh. I can listen to a man talk for five minutes, and I can tell you what's in his heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, man speaketh. You see, a man loves football, and during football season, he'll be talking about the Cowboys, if he's got anything on the ball at all. During basketball season, if he's a sportsman, he'll talk about the Mavericks and Alan Bristow a lot. If he's a golfer, he'll talk about golf. If he loves mankind and loves God, you'll hear him refer to God. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. James said the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. I see men that will take their tongue and their words and will tear other people down and tear them up. We're not to look at people's bad points and their sin, but we're to forgive them and look at their good points and encourage them. We're not to always be downing our fellow man, but rather to the contrary. The writer to Hebrews said, let us exhort one another, lift one another up. Someone said, I can find something good in the worst man that ever lived. And so we'll be accountable to God for our words. Let me go a little farther and say we'll be accountable to God for our time. Your folks say, oh, I don't have time to do this, and I don't have time to do that. You know, God, it's an amazing thing, but he gives every one of us 168 hours every week. We all have the same amount of time. Yeah. Every week. There's 24 hours in a day. There's seven days in a week. There's 168 hours in a week. All of us have the same amount of time. John Wesley was asked the question, said, what he would do if he knew the Lord would come today. He said, I'd preach at Gloucester, and then I would go home and have prayer and go to bed and wake up in glory. Time 
something you can't buy. Are you we using it wisely? How long has it been since you encouraged someone in the way and took time to care for someone else? I heard the story of a man, and I'll not call names this morning, but he and his son were on the way to close an $8 million deal. And they were driving along, and there was an old man standing out by the side of the road, hitchhiking. And they stopped and picked him up, and the son was driving. This is a true story. And the daddy told him, said, stop and pick him up. They were in a hurry going to the title company to sign an $8 million deal. They stopped and picked the old man up, and the daddy reached in his pocket and gave him a $1,000 bill riding in a new automobile. The old man looked at him and said, hey, did y'all just rob that store back down the road? The father asked the old man, said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to a nursing home in Garland to visit my wife. He said, well, tell me about it. He said, oh, I go every day. He said, I hitchhike over and I hitchhike back. He said, I have no way to go except to hitchhike. And even though that was out of their way, a way out of their way, the father told the son, said, you carry him on in. So they forgot about their $8 million deal. That wasn't important. The important thing was meeting the need of another individual that God loved. And they drove to that nursing home, and they let him out, and they said, what time do you want to go back? I'll see that my car is here to pick you up. And by the way, I'll see that my car carries you over and brings you back. Now, we all have the same 168 hours every week. You might not can give a man a thousand dollars, but you can give someone a kind word. You can go to a nursing home and reach down and love some person that has not been touched in weeks by anyone else, and no one has ever told them that they loved them in years. You can give them yourself. <laughs> we'll be accountable to God for our time. A certain millionaire was asked the question. Does your money make you happy? Does it bring peace? Does it bring contentment? He said, no. He said, well, then, you're the happiest man I believe I've ever seen. You're always laughing and smiling. What makes you happy? He said three things. Someone to love. Something to do and something to look forward to. I say that our time should be used every moment of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week should be used to help others. And when we're not helping others, we're not using our time right for God. We'll be accountable to God. Not only for our words, but for our time. Let me hurriedly say that we'll be accountable to God for our love. Our Lord said, greater love had no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. And then he said, another commandment I give unto you, and that's that you love one another. Now look at myself, I'll tell you what. Overall, I'm pretty rough of character. I don't know about you, but I, I'm hard to love. You have to practice it loving me. Hmm? You see, I've seen these people, all oh, they'd get saved, and the fella said, I was saved all over. I wasn't. Man said, mine's is saved. Mine hadn't, mine still strayed. Saw a lady that was scantily dressed, and they said, how do you look at that? I said, like this. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I hadn't been saved all over. I still have a rough character. I still have the old Adamic nature. I'm still filled with greed. I have to practice at doing what's right. And I have to remind myself at all times to do what's right. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. 
in the business that I'm in real often. I have to stay on the defensive most of the time. One day this week, Rob's got to the place to where he asked me, have you chewed anybody out today yet? He said, he told me one day this week, told, uh, said it in front of all the South. He said, boy, I like it when he gets somebody early in the morning. Then he's good the rest of the day. <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is, I have a rough character. And you know who I have problems with? I don't have problems with Cliff Oden. I have no problem with Pete Trocar. I have no problems with Rob Bruce or Ray Bay. Now, I have a little problem with Killa Dilla every once in a while. But the main character that I have problems with is the one that I look in the mirror and shave every morning. I have problems with myself. I have to work at loving you. Somebody says it's easy for you to love. Yes, it is because I work at it all the time. I just don't stay around negative people. I don't stay around people that are always down on someone else. I'm just not going to associate myself with them. I'm going to associate with myself with people that are thinking right and loving right because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we'll be accountable to God for our love. Not only that, we'll be accountable to God for our life. We must give an account for the purpose of our life. Why are you living? Hmm? We're going to have to give an account to God for the purpose of our life. Not only that, but for the direction of our life. Which direction is your life going in? I mean, what are you living for? Just for yourself? Today, I'll tell you, greed, I believe it's the number one sin in America today, greed. The number one sin. You know, if I think about myself all the time, the first thing you know, I've got problems. But when I begin to think about others and my life turns in the direction that will bring glory to God and will be a life that will help others, the first thing you know, I'm happy. I'm enjoying life, and it's a productive life. Amen. We'll give an account to God for our life, for the direction, for the meaning of our life, for the significance of our life. What is the significance of your life? Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day. And not to me only, but unto all those also that love his appearing. Amen. I mean, is your life, what is it for? Is it to be here to make this old world a little better place to live? Hmm? The songwriter said, after I leave for worlds unknown over the borderline, will I be missed by those I love? What will I leave behind? Huh? I want to touch some lives. The average man, and I conduct funerals almost weekly, had one this week, didn't we, Ann? Buried John's daddy. What a sweet man he was. I had the joy of winning him to Christ when he was 76 years old, and we buried him, buried his remains Wednesday afternoon at 1 o'clock. I conduct funerals all the time, and every funeral almost that I've ever attended or conducted, I said almost, there's grieving, and grieving is godly. But did you know you bury a man today? The world doesn't end. And usually most men within six weeks, their name is mentioned something like once a day. In three months, their name is mentioned once a week. In a year, they say their name is mentioned once a month. And past a year, they say it gets to where they're mentioned maybe two times a year. That's what statistics say the average man. But I think of names like Moody, Spurgeon, J.C. Penney, R.G. Letourneau, Gene Colgate. How often do they mention? I think of Mr. J.C. Penney, and most of us wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. J.C. Penney. 
There's no telling how much his life and his dollars have done for others. J.C. Penney went broke. And J.C. Penney found Christ. And J.C. Penney said, Lord, he said, I want to be a millionaire, not for myself, but to help others. How many would doubt the fact that he's a millionaire? And he's dead, but his name. Hmm? What about John Rockefeller? Poor little old John, his daddy was a drunk. Beat young John at the age of 14 years old. John had to drop out of school to help his mother make a living and pay the bills. John went to work sweeping a grocery store and keeping the cracker bar barrel full for a dollar and a half a week. He worked his first week. He swept no telling how many wooden floors. Got splinters in his feet because he had no shoes to wear. Ate crackers for lunch that the man that owned the store gave him. The first week he earned his dollar and a half and brought it home. And there sat his mother, Mrs. Rockefeller, with the old timey apron on the women used to wear. She was sitting in a chair and you know the old apron would make a laugh. John walked up to her and he dropped that dollar and a half in her lap. Mrs. Rockefeller said this. She said, John, with tears in her eyes, this dollar and a half is yours. You've earned it. To do with whatever you please. But said, God would be mighty pleased if you gave God his portion. Someone asked John Rockefeller years ago, said, did you tithe off of your first million? He said, if I hadn't, I'd have never made the second million. It's the Lord that gives us air to breathe. It's the Lord that warms us with the sun. It's the Lord that raises the tender vegetables for us to eat. Oh, thank God for God. We'll be accountable unto God for our life. It begins with a su submission. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. You see, you and I that are saved, we don't own ourselves. We don't own, God owns us. He said, you're not your own, you're bought with a price. And so I'll be accountable to God for my life. I must hurriedly say that I'll be accountable to God for my material possessions. God is to be first in our lives. Matthew 6, said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I've heard folks say, oh, business and Christianity don't mix. I disagree with that. Some of the greatest men I know and some of the happiest men I know have taken God as their partner and there's a smile on their face and God has blessed them with earthly treasures and earthly goods and they're enjoying them and happy and spreading God's wealth around. I know some people now that are so miserable. I'm thinking of a man right now. He don't have a lot in what we call the world today. He wouldn't give a nickel to see an elephant wrestle a monkey. He's the tag. And yet he's the most miserable man I've ever seen in my life. And one good case of cancer in his family could wipe out everything he's got. And yet on the other hand, I know some men that have gotten millions that every time you see them, there's a smile on their face, there's joy in their heart, there's a light step to their, uh, to, to their walk. They're happy. Why? Because they're sharing what God has given them with others. No way you not give God. Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given to you again. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. You'll never forgive your material possessions until first you give yourself. 1 Corinthians 8 said, The Macedonians first gave themselves unto the Lord. Your problem is not with your material possessions, but your problem is this. You have a problem with greed and yourself. 
I see some people in this church, and I'm glad to pastor this church, get this good on television. Has some here been coming for years, never give a penny for anything? Moochers. You know, I'd hate to be a part of Anywhere I go, I want to pay my way. I go in a restaurant and sit down. I always, man, I want to pay, I want to pay the bill. And some of you have been with me, and you know that's the truth. I just don't like them moochers. Do you? Huh? Boys are quiet bunch. You start talking about money, and folks get quiet. Well, if I were to go to a rooster fight, I'd want to pay my way. Come on. We talking about things now? It's, somebody said that personal. That's the reason I'm talking personal. And if it's bothering you, then it's a, a good sign to me that you're not right with God concerning greed in your heart. We'll give an account to God for our financial, our material things. Now, how should it begin? It should begin with a tithe. Leviticus 27, 30 said, The tithe is the Lord's, not mine, not yours. It's the Lord's. Somebody said, oh, son. You know, if God were to ask for all of it back, it'd be, it's rightfully his. He owns it all. Haggai chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 said, The silver and gold are mine, saith the Lord. Psalms chapter 50, he said, The beast of the forest is mine. I'm glad he owns them lions, aren't you? Amen. And all the cattle upon a thousand hills, if I were hungry, I would not ask thee, because the cattle on a thousand hills are mine, saith the Lord. Amen. God owns it all. Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 said, The world is the Lord's. Amen. Psalms chapter 24, verse 1, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Listen to me this morning. Honey, God owns everything, and God calls the shots, and you're not going to vote when you die. You didn't even vote when you came into the world. God wills you into the world, and when you leave here, it'll be God to take you out. Amen. You better have a good time while you're here. He wants you to. We'll give an account to God for our material possessions. We'll be accountable to God for our neglected opportunities. Do you realize that there are multitudes dying and going to hell every day? And America as a whole, we refuse to even try to win them. You know what made America great? We stand and we sing, oh, God bless America. Our forefathers, the ones that came and discovered America, were looking for a place to worship God. And our forefathers saw that the gospel went out to the uttermost part of the earth. Say whatever you want to. You can classify me, whatever, you can call me a, a liberal, whatever you want to, but I'm glad that America's giving and feeding other countries instead of them feeding us. Hmm? Just like I was telling Mr. Jim Maddox when he was in Congress, he and I were talking, and I think he's one of the greatest politicians alive today. And I told Jim Maddox this. I said, Jim, I lot rather pay uh, 20 or 30 cents on the dollar taxes and see all these old folks fed and taken care of and these little babies here in America fed as to not pay any tax at all and see them starve to death and die with cancer and stuff. Thank God he's given us a right and the joy and the privilege and the power to make it, hadn't he? Just passed income tax day, and some of y'all ain't no telling what you said. <laughs> God's got it on his recorder. <laughs> I never have griped about taxes. Thank God we live in a country where you can make it. Go to Russia. Go to India. Go to South America. Thank God we live here where you can make it. Don't gripe about that. Whew, I don't know how I got on that. But I did. Did you know to evangelize the world, it takes compassion for people and money for the evangelization of the world? I'm chairman of the state of Texas and have been for in my sixth term now. And I stood at a meeting this week in Dumas, Texas, and the auditorium filled with preachers, and I stood 
to talk with him. And I asked the treasurer of the state to come and say a word. There's just a few of us churches that are carrying the load. And he stood and he said this. He said, I've watched our president as he's led. And he said, some of you are not giving anything that you could give. And he said, you're just a bunch of moochers is all you are. But you look at the churches God's blessing. It's the churches that are giving. Hmm? I met with some missionaries and talked to them, and they said, Preacher, the economic situation in your average country outside of the United States, the, uh, the, uh, the interest rates and all have run things up so high until we've come home, don't have enough money to live on the field. The average foreign field now... Uh, uh, and I'm on the missions committee also, the average fire and field today, it costs at least $1,000 a month just for a little shack to live in. It's been my privilege to visit 35 mission fields. Last summer, we was on a cruise, and we went to a church for a Sunday morning service, and there was Danny walking around giving out $100 bills, them little kids running around. They were sitting on benches. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I'm glad to be an American and pay taxes in a place where you have the right kind of food. Listen, we American Christians have in our pockets the means of taking the gospel to the end of the world. Let me give you some statistics. The population of the world is now past 4 billion. Just for the sake of calculation, let's, re re let's reduce that 4 billion and say the population of the world was 100. Six of those 100 is the population of the United States. 94 is the rest of the world. These six Americans receive one half of the total income of the world. The other 94 divide the remaining one half. These six Americans consume two-thirds of the world's goods, foods, equipment, and resources. The other 94 divide the remaining one-third. These six Americans with excellent medical facilities and good nutrition have a life expectancy of 70 years. The other 94 average less than 40 years. 20 of the other 94 live in Europe, South Africa, or Japan. Some of the more wealthy and affluent ports scattered across the globe. These 20 share some of the abundance of the West, but the remaining 74 suffer poverty, hunger, disease, oppression, and tragedy beyond belief. How many of you have turned the television on and see the little baby with the big stomach and the joints enlarged how many of you, of you have seen an adult laying there starvation couldn't even afford a bowl of oatmeal you think God hadn't blessed America the United States has approximately the same population of the whole continent of Africa in 1938 Africa had 2.3 percent of the world's income and the United States of America had 25%. Today, Africa's share has declined to 2%. And the U.S. has increased to over 40%. We saying, God bless America. And I can stand and say that God has blessed America. Do you realize 133,000 people will die in the next 24 hours? and go to hell never having heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Do you, do you realize that 72% of the 4 billion that live in our world today will go to bed tonight hungry? Do you realize that there's a million more people in hell today than there was this time last Sunday? Someone said if you could freeze the whole population, none be born and none die. It would take us 420 years just to win the United States of America alone. They say if you stand them up, line them up one behind the other, the lost of the world, that they will circle the globe 30 times and that line grows at the rate of 20 miles a day and yet we have the truth, the pardon in our hands and as a whole we have our little mission emphasis. 
We'll go home today and we'll eat our pot roast and our taters and maters. And we'll say our little prayer and we'll get in front of the television. And next Friday we'll pick up our paycheck and we'll pay our car payment. Almost catch us up. We'll pay our house payment, not but a couple of weeks behind on it. We'll pay our light bill and complain about it and not even think about folks in other parts of the world that are hungry, that are dying, even over in East Garland. We'll not even think about them over there. Little kids over there that are dirty do not have the right proper medical attention that are going to bed hungry at night, mistreated. No one has ever told them that God loved them. We better get busy. God has blessed America. So then every one of us must give an account of himself to God. I was telling my wife, boy, God's been good to us. Man, I'm above J.C. Penney now. I'm up to Sears. Check that label out. I mean, I've passed that. Most of you have too. A few years ago, man, we'd be tickled to death. I didn't remember the time when we started this church. Charlie Brown's here this morning. I quit my job, sold my furniture store, sold my truck, sold everything I had, and lived for the first year off of my savings, and woke up one morning broke, didn't have anything, got rid of them good cars, and got an old 54 model Chevrolet. You remember, Charlie, didn't even have a heater in it, need the 8-volt battery to start it, and I didn't have the money to buy an 8-volt battery, had a 6-volt on it. You'd go best, and you'd have to get out and push that booger, and then hop in it, you'd get it to rolling to start. Don Bunch, you remember that? We come a long way, baby. I mean, God's blessed us, has he not? I remember that old 54 Chevrolet didn't have a heater in it. Cold, oh, it was cold. One day, Charlie wanted to borrow my car. I didn't know what he wanted with it, but I loaned it to him. He went and bought, and I went to the junkyard and bought a heater and put in that car. And he came back, oh, it was cold. He said, there's your car, and I'd been driving his pickup all day, and so I got in that car, I was fixing to go home, and he got in his pickup and followed me. And boy, I started off, and I drove a little bit, and I felt something warm on my feet. He was behind me, and he told me how I looked. I got down in that car, man, there I was going down the road, driving, trying to see what was going on. I preached for three years before I ever had a suit that fit me. That's the truth. When I got saved, I didn't own any ties. And when I get to be a big preacher, I'm going to ban them. <laughs> but God has blessed, ladies and gentlemen. And I believe Jesus said, He that hath much with him, much is required. And I look at the Jupiter Road Baptist Church today, and God has blessed the Jupiter Road Baptist Church, and God's going to require a lot out of us. We better get busy. Why, there are folks in this building this morning, they're lost. If they were to die, they'd go to hell. And yet, how many of us have prayed that some sinner would come down this aisle and trust Jesus Christ? What are you doing to make the world a better place and reach it for Christ? Let's stand together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness and for what you've done for America and you have blessed it. And then, God, thank you what you've done for the Jupiter Road Baptist Church and you have blessed it. And then, Lord, thank you for what you've done for this preacher and you have blessed him. Help me to be responsible. Bless this congregation this morning, Lord Jesus. I pray no one would leave here without Jesus Christ. Lord, might they come this morning and be saved. And then, dear Lord, I pray there's folks here that need to become a part of this great church. And I pray this morning they'd step out and we'd receive them any way the Bible bears out. Add them to us, Lord Jesus. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder this morning right where you are, how many of you say, Preacher, I know. I know right now that if I were to die, I'd go to heaven because I'm saved. Let's see your hand. Put it up good and high.
God bless you. Thank you. You can put it down now. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for the good number that raised their hand. But it bothers me that some couldn't raise their hand, and I want to see them saved right now this morning. And Lord, I'd beg you to save them. And I'd beg them at the same time to not say no to the Holy Spirit of God. Right now, Lord Jesus, I pray they'll trust you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You couldn't raise your hand a moment ago, but you don't want to go to hell. Right where you are, you'd say, Preacher, pray for me. I don't know whether I'm saved or not. If I were to die, I don't know whether I'd go to heaven or not. Please pray for me. Let's see your hand. Hold up good and high. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Would there be another one? Say, I don't know whether I'm saved or not. Please pray for me. Please pray for me. Anywhere in the building. Anywhere in the building. Right now, just slip that hand up. God bless you. Right here on the front. Right here on the front. God bless you. Would there be another one? Say, I don't know whether I'm saved or not. Please pray for me. Anywhere in the building. Right now, just get your hand up good and high. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that these that have indicated a desire to know whether they're saved or not, I pray this morning that they'd go just a step further and say yes to the Holy Spirit of God. I pray, Lord Jesus, you'd save them right now. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder how many in the service that say, Preacher, I don't have a church home. Pray with me about a church home. Let's see your hand. Pray with me about a church home. God bless you. I see that hand. Another one. Say, pray with me. God bless you. I see that hand. Another one. Say, pray with me about a church home. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray for these that are in this service that do not have a church home. God, I pray this morning they'd come forward and add them to this church. You bless them, Lord. This morning I open the doors of the church. We'll receive you any way the Bible bears out. You're hearing you unsaved this morning. You come on. You have a need. Let God meet that need. But, oh, I beg you this morning, do what God would have you to do while we sing. Come on right now. The Savior is waiting. 